In the vast ocean space of the Cook Islands are some of the deepest waters in the world, a strangely alien world of still, quiet darkness. Freezing oxygen-rich bottom water from Antarctica gently permeates the ocean floor, revealing a mass of rounded rocks that have taken millions and millions of years to form at a depth of 5,000 to 6,000 meters. The distance, say, between Avarua and Takitumu School in Matawera on our island of Rarotonga. Stretching over a great distance mostly between the islands of Aitutaki and Penrin of the Cook Islands, these rocks are full of deep sea minerals and are called manganese nodules. The minerals they contain are valuable as land mineral resources become more difficult to find and extract with increasing negative environmental and social impact. These Cook Islands nodules are so dense that it is possibly the largest concentration of nodules anywhere on Earth and worth trillions of dollars if they can be sustainably harvested. For the Cook Islands, a cluster of 15 islands in the heart of the Polynesian Triangle in the wide South Pacific Ocean, the new deep sea mineral resource brings the promise to the nation of future employment, new revenue and enhanced economic security. Cook Islanders have a special connection and respect for the ocean and its bounty, our Mona Nui or Kiva. We now see ourselves as not a remote small island nation, but as a large ocean state connected by the ocean. Endowed with beautiful lush greenery, white sandy beaches, pristine lagoons and oceans, the islands lend themselves to tourism which is increasing and not without its challenges and negative impacts. And since the 1990s, tourism has grown to contribute a large 70% of GDP from this one single source. Other economic sectors such as agriculture, pearl and fisheries are only small contributors to the economy by comparison. So for a small island nation that is dependent on tourism, the new deep sea mineral sector offers an opportunity to diversify our economy to add this new secondary source of alternative national revenue that could provide an economic safety net in the event that our tourism industry is affected by unforeseen circumstances. It has been the intent of consecutive governments of the Cook Islands to tap into this resource with the momentum picking up over the last decade. We have now put in place a structure that will allow the resource to be sustainably developed and managed while ensuring effects on the deep sea marine environment are minimized, that the revenue generated is prudently managed and for the positive economic and social impacts to be enjoyed by the people of the Cook Islands and for generations thereafter. Russian and U.S. research ships scouring the Pacific Ocean in the 1970s were the first to report the occurrence of deep sea mineral resources in and around the islands of the Cook Islands, known as manganese nodules. In the 1970s, the Premier Albert Henry was part of the New Zealand delegation that attended the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention that was held in Caracas, Venezuela. The Premier spoke on behalf of the small island states, making an impassioned plea that large nations recognize the rights of islands people and nations to the resources of ocean. In 1982, the concept of the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone became accepted therefore, giving the Cook Islands the rights to these resources under the United Nations Convention on the law of the sea. We now enjoy that national right to utilize the marine resources in our sovereign waters while protecting the marine environment and this includes fisheries and seabed minerals. A number of Cook Islanders have been involved in the initial surveys that first reported high concentration of nodules. It was in uh, 1974 when the Russians uh, applied to the government for 
a permit to, to do some investigative uh, work in our seas. Uh, and under the, um, the guardian, the leadership of, of a scientist called Professor Bizukov uh, on the uh, vessel, oceanographic research vessel, the Avitias, in 1974, when they were given the permit, I was uh, assigned by our Prime Minister at the time, the late Sir Albert Henry, to be the Cook Islands uh, attache, att attachment to the program. That was the beginning of my involvement with our deep sea minerals uh, in our um, attempt to, to investigate and to really find out whether there is um, uh, economic wealth in our oceans. The first uh, ship that I went on, uh, this was in 1977, it's more of a, it's like a yacht. Uh, there were five of us from the Cook Islands that went on this um, uh, boat. Um, the name of the boat is the Machias. Uh, the main reason is to look at the, the black corals uh, within the southern Cook Islands. For that uh, research, we found there were a couple of those manganese nodules that were seen around um, the Ngaputuru area, uh, closer to Aitutaki. Then it was then uh, recorded during that time by Tony Utama, because he was the one that put me on that boat with a couple of other Cook Islanders like uh, Edwin Utama, Ngatama, Taomia, and, and Tony himself, uh, we were on that boat. Various other research works were sponsored by other countries also conducted their own research trips confirming the presence of nodules in various places from the southwest of Rarotonga, close by Suwaro, past Aitutaki, and up through to Penman. However, the most comprehensive geological surveys were conducted by Japan in partnership with SOPAC. In a survey across the Pacific from the North Pacific to Tahiti and back, the survey vessel Hakurei Maru made several research voyages in our waters, concentrating on the deep seabed between Aitutaki and Penman, and reported the presence of nodules. In 1995, the Pacific Regional Geoscience Body, SOPAC, with the cooperation of Japan, began a 21-year survey of the South Pacific Ocean, which provided a better indication of what quantities of the deep sea minerals existed in various areas of the Cook Islands EEZ and what their mineral composition was. Stuart Kingan, he was a government scientist of the day. He built a, a, a very substantial research area by where the government now stores its archive files. When I arrived here, I could never find that. And uh, I, I figured out eventually from talking to people in the area that in the 2005 hurricane season you had here, the building basically got trashed by the hurricanes, the roof got blown off and eventually the building caught fire and all that vast amount of information was picked up and taken to the dump. Fortunately, SOPAC had most of the information stored on their files uh, in, in Fiji. So we managed to pull that information back to Cook Islands and it was an incredible amount of information. Um, we managed to get a company in New Zealand, who did a very, very good job of digitising all the information of the samples, of the locations, depths, and put it into a GIS database, which we now have. Over a million square kilometres, or over 50% of the Cook Islands EEZ has been surveyed up to 2005. This information has been collected onto maps that help the country understand the extent of this resource. With this map, shows the concentrations of nodules within the Cook Islands EEZ. The blue areas have no or low amounts of nodules. The yellow areas have nodules densities of 10 kilograms per square meter. The orange areas have nodule densities of 20 kilograms per square meter. And the red areas have densities of an amazing 30 kilograms per square meter and above some of the highest densities in the world. The areas colored yellow, orange and red are also areas where the water is extremely deep and in the order of 5,000 meters. The main concentration of nodules is in the South Penrhyn Basin, 
which occupies an area of 1,500 kilometers between the islands of Aitutaki and Penu, and 250 kilometers wide. There is an estimated 10 billion tons of nodules sitting on the deep ocean floor in this vast area. This is two times the abundance of any other nodule resource in the world. Manganese nodules are found in many places, but there are only four areas in the world that have significant nodule resources. And this is in part of the ocean between Mexico and Hawaii, called the clarion clipperton Fracture Zone, the Peru Basin, the Central Indian Ocean, and the South Penrhyn Basin. Apart from the South Penrhyn Basin, the other three locations are in international waters and governed by the International Seabed Authority. A nodule takes millions of years to form. Most of the nodules in the Cook Islands waters are estimated at 30 million years old. They range from 2 to 8 centimeters in diameter. The nodules we have here in the Cook Islands form on the very surface of the sediment uh, and we've got they form from mineral rich waters um, from something called the Antarctic bottom water. It's a big deep sea current flowing along the sea floor. And the idea is because they're sitting right on the surface, um, gradually they just roll a little bit and they form and then they roll a bit further and they get nice and spherical. They stay on the surface of the sediment. In the centre of our nodules, um, something called a nucleus or a nucleating point. Uh, there will commonly be a bit of fish tooth, a bit of fish bone, maybe a little piece of sediment, um, you know, a little, a little sand or silt grain. There are some differences in the manganese nodules of the Cook Islands to nodules in other areas. Our nodules sit on top of the seabed as opposed to being buried in the sediment. They are also smoother, roundish, uniform shape and have a different mineral composition than those from other areas. The nodules of the Cook Islands have already been analyzed for their mineral content. Knowledge of the mineral content and in what quantities allow potential investors to determine the feasibility for overseas companies of investing into the seabed minerals industry. The world demand and cost for the various types of minerals will determine whether the nodules can profitably extract them. Each nodule has a number of metals such as manganese, cobalt, nickel and copper. Currently, these metals are abundant from land-based sources. But land resources are dwindling, becoming harder to find and extract without the increasing environment and social dislocation. Seabed minerals could be harvested with potentially less environmental and social disturbance. The nodules also contain a number of rare earth elements which would garner more interest than the more common metals. In recent years, interest has turned away from the nodules and more towards the sediment bed underneath than the nodules on the surface of the deep sea bed. The sediment bed is rich in rare earth elements such as scandium, which is used in aerospace and high-tech industrial uses. The mineral content of the sediment bed has also been analysed. This way is probably about, about 150 grams. You, you need a tonne of these and you'll probably get about maybe a kilogram of rare earth elements, maybe less, maybe half a kilogram. But that half a kilogram is well and truly makes it worthwhile extracting these nodules apart from the other minerals that you'll get out. Since they were discovered, the ocean depth of 5,000 meters, the world price, land-based availability and demand of various minerals have meant that harvesting the manganese nodules of the Cook Islands have not been commercially attractive. This has allowed the country time to develop a proper framework for the governance of this resource. It's very important for us as a country that we uh, protect and ensure that we receive a fair return for the assets that our minerals 
uh, have in store for our country. Uh, we were the first country in the world to pass specific seabed minerals legislation in 2009, uh, and we've also uh, put in place a very strong and robust and a fair licensing system which will enable the commencement of exploration uh, of our seabed minerals. Uh, recently, the government has also passed legislation, amendments to the Income Tax Act, to ensure that any mineral activity that occurs in the future where revenues are gained uh, from the exploitation of our minerals, uh, that the royal royalty payments to our country is very clearly outlined to companies that are involved, uh, the taxation obligations on these companies to ensure that our country receives a fair return from these minerals, uh, again, clearly outlined. Uh, so that from the outset, uh, those ca companies that wish to partner with our country for the exploitation of our minerals uh, know upfront exactly what their obligations are. The Seabed Minerals Act of 2009 sets out the legal framework for the efficient management of seabed minerals in the country. The Honourable Tom Masters became the first Minister for Seabed Minerals. When Tom Masters was appointed as Queen's representative, the portfolio for seabed minerals passed to the Honourable Mark Brown. This was in 2013, which was a significant year for the industry as the Seabed Minerals Act came into force in that year on the 1st of March. A Seabed Minerals Commissioner, local lawyer Mr Paul Lynch, was appointed. The Seabed Minerals Authority was opened, an advisory board appointed and staff contracted. Much work has been done since then to build up the capacities and local staff of the authority. The Seabed Minerals Authority is the government office that has the role of implementing the Seabed Minerals Act. And that act is about the sustainable and good management of seabed minerals resources in the Cook Islands. It's actually the first act in the world that ever dealt with uh, seabed minerals a dedicated legislation, national legislation, to deal with the good management of seabed minerals in an EEZ. So we made um, history by having that in 2009, and now we've made history by, in 2013, establishing world's first dedicated seabed minerals government authority for the management of national uh, seabed minerals resources. So the framework of this office is you have the commissioner, we also have a, a legal division, which our first lawyer was Alex Herman. Uh, she's from the Her big Herman family uh, from Mitiaro. And uh, Caroline Tita is our finance and compliance officer. We've also had Daryl Thorburn, and Daryl was brought in to help us uh, as a developing nation uh, set up this regulatory framework for the management of seabed minerals in the Cook Islands. We've also had uh, Marino Witchman employed now. He's a young G Cook Islander GIS officer. GIS is Geographical Information Systems. So he will be, a, uh, he's already very uh, experienced, even for a young man, at managing our data because there's going to be a lot of data coming out of our sea on the environment and the minerals, and we have to manage, control, and be able to use and understand that uh, data so that we can make good decisions for the benefit of our own country. Uh, we've just had Tom Whidden, who's a, uh, related to the Toka family from Rakahanga. He's been on a, a four-month uh, marine geology internship, and he's been great. So the idea is to bring in Cook Islanders to learn and assist the Seabed Minerals Authority take the necessary steps to manage this uh, exciting new frontier uh, sector of our economy. 2015 was also another significant year for the industry. In that year, the exploration licensing regulations were passed and the first tender for exploratory licenses was undertaken. In 2016, the Cook Islands government signed a contract with the International Seabirds Authority for the exclusive mineral rights to 75,000 square kilometres within the clarin Clipperton Fracture Zone. This is an area of international waters between Mexico and Hawaii. The International Seabed Authority has given the 150,000 square kilometers rights of the clarin Clipperton Zone to various countries who had applied for them. 
but with the understanding that they were to return parts of their quota that will then be given to developing countries. The Cook Islands contract areas are highlighted on this map. Several countries of the Pacific have been fortunate to receive a contract in the zone. In a related joint venture agreement signed with GTEC, Sea Minerals Resources of Belgium, GSR, this company can undertake the exploration work for the Cook Islands and one day exploit the minerals for the mutual benefit of the company and the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands deep sea mineral resource is vast and valuable. It is hoped that one day it will make a significant positive impact on the economic and social well-being of our nation. So we have the challenge to be good stewards of our ocean and its resources and biodiversity and ensure that in the future decisions that we make will improve the lives of the people while continuing to protect our culture and marine environment for generations to come.